we're looking at one of the hottest topics in clean energy, clean energy jobs. These are the kind of questions that we're hearing every day. We're seeing a lot of media coverage. We know it's a hot topic, especially now with the economic downturn. Um, energy efficiency practitioners are not used to being so popular. It's like not getting asked to the prom for many, many years, and all of a sudden we have more dates than we know what to do with. Um, we, you know, energy efficiency has been underfunded in, in comparison to the potential for energy savings out there in the marketplace, but now there's a new renaissance of interest in energy efficiency, especially as an economic development force. So we know that energy efficiency is already a good solution to climate change and economic development and creating safer, healthier, more comfortable places to live and to work. Um, but now we want to know some new answers, right? We want to know where are these jobs? Which ones are going to be particularly relevant here in the Midwest, which is our sort of beleaguered, rust belt, stranded manufacturing economy in many ways? What about after stimulus funding? Is there life after stimulus funding? We're going to be looking a little bit at that today. What's happening right now across the Midwest in particular? What do employers have to say? How will this opportunity affect contractors who are already in the field working on energy efficiency projects? I know from looking at the attendee list that there are a lot of you online today with us. So how will this affect you? What are your economic opportunities? Um, how can we save a lot of energy and get people back to work at the same time and as soon as possible? So I think now, Andrea, how close are we to being able to look at our who are you question? <clears throat> I hope that uh, folks have identified yourself. And in a minute, Andrea will have the results up on a magical screen I can see. I think you can all click on the poll results icon on your desktop as well. So we have about... Uh, 15%, 16% of you are building professionals, so you are those contractors out there working in the field right now. 6% um, or so community planning, another couple percent in uh, economic development. A lot of educators on board, and welcome energy efficiency folks, uh, our tribe, you're here. Um, this will be a great day for us to build some cross connections between energy efficiency practitioners and workforce development practitioners. We've got some government uh, folks showing up. Um, and also some utility people and some workforce development people with us today. So it's a great cross-representation. That's really good. We're talking about connecting supply and demand, and I think we have both sets of issues represented here today. So <clears throat> here's what we're going to do in the next hour. First, we're going to take a big picture look, especially at jobs and energy efficiency. And then we're going to do a deeper dive just into the home retrofit market because that's such an interesting and challenging opportunity for us. So that's what we'll be doing. And it'll roughly be divided into the first half of the webinar and the second half of the webinar. So how did we approach this question? You know, we saw all those interesting questions. How do you find out the answers? Well, here's what we did. Um, <clears throat> this is a very dynamic, changing, evolving uh, topic of conversation. Energy efficiency is evolving, clean energy is evolving, the jobs situation is evolving. And so we looked at it in a few ways. Um, first of all, we focused on the upper Midwest. That's where the Energy Center is. We know there are a lot of economic development challenges in the upper Midwest. We wanted to see what's happening in these Rust Belt states close to home. And then we did a literature review. We looked at a variety of literature from a policy, workforce development, and energy efficiency set of perspectives. The largest body of work that we could find is from organizations who are seeking to get this policy right and set our policy agenda, since so much of this is new or emerging at scale for the first time. Um, it's a testament to how early in the conversation we really are. Um, and our resources page that accompanies the webinar has a lot of the better studies that we found that we thought would be particularly useful to people trying to make stuff happen on the ground. So I think we have 10 or so links to different resources available for you there. So have fun with those. Um, and then we did kind of a informal following the money. Uh, we're especially interested in stimulus money and where is that going and what is it doing? And so we're going to talk towards the end of the webinar about $50 million of green jobs, Department of Labor allocations that have come into three states of the Midwest and give you a little bit of background on that Department of Labor allocation. That's money that not everybody in energy efficiency follows. We usually follow Department of Energy and EPA dollars. 
Um, we've looked at some of the grant applications. We've spoken t to some of the grant administrators, so we'll be sharing what we learned about that in relation to the home retrofit market. Um, a couple of quick conclusions. Uh, we, after our literature review and our money trail, um, we concluded that the grants and the reports and the awards are doing a good job of including perspectives from large clean energy employers, um, big wind energy companies, for example. Um, but they're inadequate in representing the small contractors who make up so much of the energy efficiency employer force. And so after we figured that out, we went after the perspective of those smaller employers. We did that in a couple of ways. We conducted a focus group in uh, the Midwest with um, mostly small contractors from Illinois and Wisconsin. We also conducted a telephone survey of 300 or so contractors registered as uh, trade ally providers in the renewable energy and residential programs for Wisconsin statewide energy efficiency program focus on energy. Most of these are companies who have been doing this for a long time, um, a couple of decades, so we found their perspectives particularly useful. And then we also facilitated a working group of policy, workforce development, energy, and energy efficiency leaders and brought in some of those employers at the Better Buildings, Better Business Conference in March so that they could talk about and start a conversation about how are we all going to work together to connect supply and demand for these jobs, for the energy efficiency savings opportunities that we have, how we're going to get people back to work and save a lot of energy. Um, and we've also throughout conducted interviews with several thought leaders so we can get some national and regional perspectives. So I wouldn't look at this uh, inquiry as a rigorous research study. Um, much of the work that the Energy Center does is very rigorous and you can find many, many research studies on our website. This is more like field notes as we're out there trying to figure out what's going on in real time. As I mentioned, we um, have a special focus on three states for a few reasons. Wisconsin, 8.8% um, unemployment. Michigan, 14% unemployment. Illinois, 11% unemployment. And then we looked at $50 million of Department of Labor Green Jobs money, and we've also been tracking a couple billion dollars of Department of Energy dollars that have come in. One of the things that our energy efficiency practitioners know is that Wisconsin has had ratepayer-funded energy efficiency programs for decades <coughs> have a, and has a, had a statewide program for over 10 years. Illinois and Michigan are just starting on their journey with new ratepayer funded programs. So there's a lot of interesting ways of looking at those states and how they're similar and what, how they differ because of those situations. Um, I want to point out about unemployment. This is the general unemployment rate that you see here. What's not shown is unemployment in the construction industry, which has just topped out at 27%. So it's a very serious crisis. And when you think about a lot of the building energy efficiency in commercial buildings and um, homes, that's the construction industry that we're talking about. That's an industry that's been very hard hit by unemployment. Um, another factor that you may have watched in the news, there's a big disparity between white-collar unemployment at the higher levels of professional class jobs and blue-collar unemployment. This is really a crisis that's being borne disproportionately by blue-collar folks, which is why there's been so much activism around green jobs. So we're going to take a look at some of the more blue-collar solutions in the second half of the webinar. <coughs> um, you can, you know, we've talked a little bit about the stimulus money coming in. We looked at the Midwest because it is our home and it's central in the fight to revitalize the national economy. It's also a place where there's a lot of exciting energy efficiency opportunity emerging. Um, so we think there's a lot of interesting stuff to look at here in the Midwest. <coughs> Before we take a look, let's try to answer a question briefly. What is a clean energy job? Um, we'll take a step back. Before we discuss what a clean energy job is, let's get an idea from you, our participants, how you view a clean energy job. So if you look back on your screen and find your pie chart icon that leads you to your polls, um, you should click on that. It should bring you up a poll. You're looking for poll number two. And it says, which of these jobs will be a clean energy job in the year 2015, five years from now? And you can select any that you think would be um, a clean energy job in 2015. So I'll give you a second to do that. Great. As you do that, I'll keep rolling. 
Uh, we're going to take a look at those results in a minute. Um, this is the traditional cartoon of how energy is um, created and distributed, generated and distributed, and comes to our homes and offices. You have the power plant on the left of your screen and the transmission lines, and then our homes and offices um, and businesses on the right-hand side. This is the past. This is how things looked in the past. Very simple. Um, there's a new transition that's already emerging now. Um, we expect it to be widely in place by the year 2020. And this really changes things up. And this is how we're going to track this to where our jobs are, right? So now that central plant becomes more of an energy hub, and the centralized generation with the transmission lines is one of the opportunities, but we also have generation happening at farms and forests. We're gathering biomass, and um, we're, t we're turning waste into energy. We have wind farms and solar farms. And then, of course, at the customer end, we also have customer-sided generation through photovoltaics or customer-sided wind. Um, and those little hubs and nodes that you see in the middle, those are where we're going to see the smart grid kick in, where there's going to be a better exchange of information between the central plant and all of this different opportunity to find new energy sources. This transition will create a lot of jobs. Um, it's going to be very interesting to watch what the opportunities are. This power system is cleaner because it depends less on burning fossil fuels. It's been an interesting couple of months for fossil fuels. We've seen the, um, the mine disaster in Virginia, and now we have the explosion in the Gulf Coast, and we can kind of see what it means to be a fossil fuel-dependent society and what, what those sacrifices mean. This is a cleaner picture because it has more of a mix um, and we also think there's a lot of opportunity here. So let's take a look at what you thought would be a clean energy job. Okay, so everybody pretty much agrees a wind energy technician is a clean energy job, right? And a lot of people agree that insulation and air sealing contractors are clean energy jobs. Awesome. Very glad to see that. Um, most people think a city sustainability director has something to do with clean energy, right? Um, no reality TV show, show host, not so much. Um, janitor, and we're going to talk about janitors in a minute. And you can see some, some people said farmer. So let's take a look at that. Um, as we look at the kinds of jobs that are emerging from this changed picture, we've sorted them into some different piles, right? And this is some, somewhat how the workforce development profession talks about some of these jobs. They talk a lot in workforce development about incumbent jobs. These are jobs that are not necessarily green or clean today, but will be in the future, but will not require extensive amounts of retooling. These are people um, who can apply the skills that they have to some of the new technologies. So here we see a farmer, right? Um, a farmer could be a clean energy job in the future because that farmer might be figuring out how to repurpose his waste streams to become part of the energy generation system. Um, but he probably doesn't have to change a whole lot about how he approaches his work. Same with an electrician. They have a rigorous career path already that they follow in developing that profession. Maybe they just need to learn what the new technologies are. Power plant operator, you know, go, maybe this power plant operator goes from operating a coal-fired plant to a biomass-fired plant. Jobs where There'll be some new opportunities. They'll have to retool with a little continuing education, but essentially they have most of the skills that they need. Here's the second example um, where we're looking at new jobs. This is the hot topic. This is what you see all the media coverage about, um, especially people are in love with wind technicians. There's something so iconic about these wind farms and how they move and people see them as a symbol of a new clean energy economy. And for sure, there will be many more new jobs in wind and solar, geothermal, in those kind of um, areas. Here's another job that we think is very important, sustainability director. College campuses, municipalities, corporations, associations even, they're all adding sustainability directors. Even five years ago, this would have been a position that was an anomaly. But not on a, like for example, on a college campus, now it's a standard job. They have sustainability directors of campuses have 
conventions that they go to and they gather and share best practices. Corporations are starting to add sustainability directors because they have new focuses on corporate social and environmental responsibility and they need to make good decisions inside that preserve their competitive edge. Um, sustainability director, this is a multidisciplinary job. This is a really interesting emerging new job. Practitioners need some baseline technical literacy, right? Um, so that they can understand the quantitative and the engineering issues behind energy and waste and water. But they also are going to need an understanding of the behavioral interventions that we need, like social marketing and community organizing that will motivate people to change their own energy use behavior or their own waste or water use behavior. They might even need to be media savvy. Um, so that, that's a really interesting job mix and it'll look, it'll be interesting to watch in the future how, what kind of different disciplines sustainability director pulls from. Home energy rater, I think a lot of you online have already heard of this job. This is a job that we think will, uh, there'll be more of in the immediate future. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about home energy and home retrofits later on in the webinar, so I won't go into it too much, but it's basically a person who can help a homeowner identify the technical opportunities in their structure with their equipment and in their shell of their home to save energy. Here's a third category that I'm calling elevated jobs. These are jobs that will take on a new significance in the clean energy economy. They require very little skill to do poorly, but they require a lot of knowledge and skill to do correctly in a way that saves energy and creates a safe and healthy and comfortable um, atmosphere for people to live and work. And they need, you need a lot of knowledge and skill to deliver verifiable energy savings. So public perceptions of these jobs right now really need to shift to recognize that these are not low skill, no skill jobs. They're jobs that need um, a lot of training and knowledge to get the jobs done right. So let's talk about some examples. Weatherization technician. The public, in general, might perceive this as a low-skilled job, maybe because weatherization technicians mostly operate right now in low-income homes, and middle-class people don't really have them on their radar, right? In reality, weatherization technicians undergo pretty rigorous training. They do a lot of in-field training. They get a lot of hands-on mentoring from experienced staff. And they have to do a lot of continuing education because of all the measurement and verification protocols required in the Federal Weatherization Program. They don't just know about building science, but they also know about health and safety, and they know about pretty complicated administrative processes. Here's a second one, certified building operator. That is a code word for a job that used to be called janitor or maintenance man. Remember all those smart grid nodes that we saw on our picture? Think about how complex our buildings will be in the future if they generate part of the energy they use and if some of our energy conservation is automated by sophisticated controls that are related to other things outside of our buildings where we work. Suddenly this janitor or this maintenance operator becomes an intelligence agent, right, who can seek out and operate and interpret all of those smart grid indicators and who becomes the champion of energy efficiency, waste reduction, water efficiency inside the place where that person works. That's going to require a new level of skills and knowledge. Most of the buildings where we work in this country are 100,000 square feet or smaller. They are not under the management of a facilities engineer who has a four-year engineering degree. Mostly it's janitors and maintenance staff who are taking care of these buildings. So we've posted a link on our link site to the Building Operator Certification Training Program. If you know a ma maintenance person or a janitor who wants to be part of this movement, and um, we really see a transformation with these people when they go through this training. It's very exciting. So how about certified building anal analyst or envelope specialist? That's where your home energy reader comes into play. Um, that's also where we see insulation and air sealing contractors. Um, we always want to use the word air sealing with insulation, by the way, if you're not from uh, ener the energy tribe. Um, one of our focus group employers said that insulation contractors and roofers are kind of fighting in this race to the bottom to be perceived by the public as a low-skilled job. But we know now 
that those kind of jobs in the clean energy economy are going to require much more grounding in building science and specific credentials in order to do the job right. So why is that important? Well, work on the building envelope that's not done correctly. First of all, it's not going to deliver the energy savings that we're promising, but it could also create some unsafe conditions. Um, indoor air quality problems, some unsafe combustion conditions. The people that are doing this work need credentials and training and a lot of field experience to get it right. This is not a low skill job. If you review the workforce literature, you will see some terms like middle skill job. Um, and these jobs, these elevated jobs, would fall under that middle skill category. You don't need a four year college degree to do them, but you do need a lot of occupational training. You might need an associate's degree or a degree from a technical or a community college. You need some work with um, getting some credentials. I think it's also really important to recognize with this category the shift in public perception that we need to create and support to make sure that we get um, the, the right kind of workforce involved with these jobs. It will be very critical for program managers to ensure that public information campaigns help homeowners and building owners understand the level of skill that's required to do these jobs right. All right, so now we know what kind of jobs we're probably talking about. We have some examples. How are they going to be created? Where is the demand? This is a hot topic. Our contractors and practitioners who are out there right now are still experiencing the recession. They will tell you they don't have such high demand as they would like. Let's look at how jobs will be created in the Midwest. Here's a picture. Um, and let's look especially after stimulus. This is a picture of what life might look like after stimulus. For the rest of the webinar, I'm going to focus on energy efficiency in specific and we'll put renewable energy jobs and those kind of things to the side because energy efficiency is going to produce a lot more jobs um, and because uh, energy efficiency is also a very cheap, uh, much easier thing for homeowners and building owners to get their heads around and invest in. If we think about it through an economic filter, energy efficiency also saves homeowners and business owners money in tough economic times. It's the cheapest clean energy resource. We have another webinar that you can stream that talks about um, energy efficiency as a great choice, and there's a link to that on um, our resources page. And it also creates a plethora of other benefits like safer, more comfortable buildings where we live and work. This map is from a December 2009 study by the American Council on an Energy Efficient Economy. If you're not from the Energy Tribe, I really recommend ACEEE as a national source of information on energy efficiency in particular. So if you're designing a degree program, you're an educator, you're just getting into this green jobs, clean jobs situation in uh, workforce development, ACEEE is a great resource and we've posted a link for you there. Um, in, so you see all these states, right? All of these states in orange now have aggressive minimum requirements for energy efficiency savings that will be funded through ratepayer programs. Wisconsin, um, we just had legislation that uh, was declined last week. We're not done with uh, moving that forward, I think, in Wisconsin, but for now we don't have those standards that these other states have. In most states, these programs are run by utilities or there's a statewide administrator. Um, we think that's the way it will look in Indiana. That's certainly the way it looks in Wisconsin. So wh why does this matter? Well, if you would have looked at this map a couple of years ago, very few of these states would have been orange. Very few would have had mandatory targets for energy efficiency. And these targets are aggressive. Some of the targets are over double what we've been doing in Wisconsin for years with very well-developed leading programs. So how does this translate into jobs? Well, here's a really simple cartoon that might show you. <coughs> we have programs. We have program managers. Many of you are online right now with us. We design programs that get customers to save energy. The customer makes uh, I'm going to save energy decision um, and that sets kind of the job creation into action. So in the past, about half the states in the United States have had ratepayer funded energy efficiency programs. Now we also have cities and communities coming online with sustainability programs that incorporate energy efficiency. We know we have some of you folks online with us today. More programs are coming online and they have wider mandates and more flexibility and fewer regulatory restrictions in their scopes. This is a really big opportunity for sustainability and also for job creation. 
Ratepayer programs traditionally use incentives and rebates, financing, technical assistance, mass marketing, energy audits. Those are the kind of tools that we use in traditional ratepayer programs. In the future, because goals are higher and new players like cities are running programs, we think we'll also need to use very clever behavior change strategies like organizing neighborhoods and running campaigns and leveraging peer pressure and customer feedback devices and um, engaging community groups to encourage people to change their energy use behavior. So our program managers will have to be part engineer and part psychologist. If our programs are successful, then more dis customers make a decision to save energy, right? It's logical, it's obvious, but we don't talk about that all in, always in the job creation conversation. We really need our programs to be as effective as possible so that the customer will hire a contractor to install an energy efficiency measure, like a new boiler or an HVAC control or insulation, and that drives job creation in a couple ways. It ca ca causes a need for products to be manufactured, an increase in customer demand means more manufacturing jobs. That has a lot of domestic implications because most of our manufacturing jobs in this sector are local. And we've posted a link to a New York Times feature that shows you how local, especially in the home retrofit market, our products are. Services, this will be the focus for most of our webinar today, <coughs> on the, are focused on the technical jobs that are required to correctly install energy savings. This diagram seems really obvious, but we didn't find this topic discussed very much in the literature, especially the efficacy of programs in driving customer demand and how important it is to have well-designed programs. And if that's important to you, you can tune into the webinar in July that will be addressing that very topic. Um, so let's not miss any opportunities to create jobs and economic benefits and energy efficiency. I want to say just one note about programs. We've also posted a study to a recent, um, I posted a link to a recent study by Lawrence Berkeley National Labs that addresses the talent shortage in that red box at the top of the chain. If you are in community sustainability programming or higher education planning, please take a look at this study. Energy efficiency professionals already know what the war for talent looks like in that red box. We are looking for uh, ways to fill the severe shortage of experienced, qualified individuals who understand how to run energy efficiency and sustainability programs. Um, the people who are responsible for efficacy, for how much customer action gets taking, right, taken, right? There's a number of recommendations in this report, including more targeted education and training, uh, coordination of training efforts and best practices between states, um, train the trainer programs and on the job training. Um, and there's a really great appendix in there that talks about which universities have programs that actually feed this red box with qualified individuals. It's not a very long list. So that's a big opportunity for higher education. Um, this shortage might require our energy efficiency regulators to rethink how we aim resources at workforce development because we need good program managers in these spots so that we can achieve those higher energy savings goals. So here's our model for how demand will be created. How are we going to create supply? Well, we borrowed this picture from our friends at the Wisconsin, Development of, uh, De Wisconsin Department of Workforce Development. This shows career pathways and how that works. This isn't something we've had to think about in energy efficiency very much, right? We kind of had people find us by accident or go into this business by accident, especially in the residential market if you think about how people got involved it wasn't through a rigorous career pathway that was clearly outlined like this. Now the skilled trades will recognize this pathway. Um, educators will recognize it. Workforce development people will think this is obvious, right? So you see on the left, uh, the spectrum, um, on the left of the spectrum, efforts to prepare unskilled workers for work. So there's a lot of workforce readiness programs, basic literacy, basic math, adult basic ed, English as a second language, those kinds of things at the left hand side. In the middle, you see the kinds of credentials and occupational certificates you can get on the job. We're going to talk more about credentials a little later in the webinar. And on the right side, you see higher education, whether that's community colleges and technical schools or whether it's a baccalaureate degree or higher. This is a pretty straightforward model but energy efficiency experts, we know it doesn't really work like this yet in our industry. Um, lots of us came into this work by accident. Lots of our contractors came into it by accident. 
the demand for energy efficiency services has been low enough that there hasn't been a demand for this career pathway model. And there really hasn't been much price support tolerance out in the marketplace. People are still looking for the lowest bid. And this is a pretty professionalized model. We think this is really going to change over the next decade, and these pathways are going to start moving into place. Those elevated jobs will be moving into this pathways model. Things like the weatherization tech or the envelope specialist. There's going to be more apprenticeships emerging that address energy efficiency skills. With the convergence of energy efficiency and workforce development, that will hopefully give us the lift we need to get our energy savings to new performance levels. And these kind of pathways will give us the skills that we need to do it right. Hopefully they will also create career paths that will be attractive to job seekers and who want advancement and who want adequate wages to support a family. So we think the future is quite rosy in terms of enormous potential. If you look at that green area in the middle between those faces, that shows the future that we can achieve, but these two disciplines need to start to work together on the supply side and the demand side. Some of these very early connections are being supported by federal stimulus funding, but we need the convergence to accelerate and we need it to continue and be sustained in order to really deliver. So from our field work, we've developed some findings and recommendations that will help us get there faster. Okay, we've talked about this a little bit. These talent shortages at the top could slow down demand ramp up. Um, we need to deal with this. We need our energy efficiency community to partner with higher education to communicate what the job opportunities are, what are the requirements. Simple things like letting mechanical engineering programs understand that there's a huge market for energy modelers who can model the energy use of buildings. Everybody who's trying to hire energy modelers is probably nodding their head right now. Um, helping our environmental programs and our policy programs understand the special needs of energy efficiency programs. We need to invest in training and mentoring at the senior level to make sure that we can reproduce ourselves and our senior leaders. And we might need to look outside traditional energy efficiency disciplines. We've pulled a lot of people from economics. We've pulled a lot of people from engineering. We might need to pull people from other professional disciplines and bodies of knowledge. This is a tremendous opportunity for energy efficiency programs to include high level workforce development possibly even reorient funding so that we get the high-skilled workforce we need to meet our tough goals. So here's another finding. Not so much connective tissue in the literature review and in practice in the field yet between workforce development professionals and energy efficiency professionals. So I'm using those terms really broadly. We'll put our energy efficiency program managers and our contractors on one side of the spectrum. We'll put our educators, our workforce development program folks, our job center people on the other side. We followed several of the green jobs grants through the Department of Labor and it was really interesting how few of them included much participation from energy efficiency players, even though the training programs are really focused on energy efficiency as one of the job opportunities. And then on the flip side, very few Department of Energy grants include many workforce development players, but we know we're going to run into some workforce constraints as we ramp up. So there's a big opportunity to make connections there. On the Department of Energy side, there were better links to community colleges and universities than to the traditional workforce development system. We also found very little awareness uh, from energy efficiency players about what workforce development can do for them. The kinds of training and placement services that are there, way, things that will help employers reduce their costs for hiring and recruiting. Um, we really recommend that energy efficiency folks go visit their job center and find out what is available for them. And then also on these grant programs, we would like to make sure that the steering committees include more robust representation from both sides of the spectrum. Um, before we get to the uh, next recommendation, I want to talk about kind of why this connective tissue hasn't been there. And this is a picture that kind of summarizes something I've been experiencing out in the field as an energy nerd myself. We've had so many constraints on what we could do in our programs or how much money we had or what the opportunities were. That's kind of represented by these arrows that our imagination has gotten small to fit the footprint of what we've been allowed to do. We need um, some therapy work on our bandwidth of our imagination. This is kind of a syndrome that's afflicting a lot of energy efficiency folks as they say, well, 
is this ramp up really going to happen? I'm kind of skeptical about it. You know, we've been working in a constrained environment for a while. So when we are re reading these reports about all these great job opportunities, our imaginations are having a hard time holding that. And we're reading about our own industry. We need to start to stretch that out. Municipal sustainability directors and workforce development professionals don't have this. They think energy efficiency and clean energy is just a wide open pasture of opportunity. Maybe we need to work together to kind of stretch that bandwidth out. Um, here's one of the reasons why. This is from our potential study in Wisconsin. Um, there's a link to that on our resource site. Um, if you look at um, what's in the existing bar in the middle, it shows you we've missed more energy savings opportunities than we've captured because we've had constraints on what we could spend to go after those opportunities. So in the future, we're going to have a lot more opportunity because we have new targets that are much more aggressive. If you think about our industry compared with healthcare or high tech or auto manufacturing or even construction before construction started to move green, energy efficiency just was not delivering the jobs to create the connection between workforce development and energy efficiency. That's all starting to change now. So a couple of very specific recommendations. Get small employers involved the contractors who are going to be making energy efficiency happen on the ground in your local community. Get them on task forces and committees, ask their opinions, make sure that they understand what services we can provide to them. Um, we, we think that we need some outreach work to those employers to get them engaged. Also because they can tell you what it's really like out in the field and exactly what they're looking for in terms of employees. By the same token, we think energy efficiency programs and trade allies would find a lot of value from connecting with workforce development. And then we need to work together on those career paths so that they're relevant to energy efficiency. So those are our broad recommendations. Um, in the second half of the webinar, we're going to take a look at the home retrofit market. Just wanted to remind you, if you haven't sent in your questions, it's time to do that now to, so that we can look at those at the end of the webinar. Now let's do a focus. Oh, hey, yes, so we're going to look at the home retrofit market. I'm going to ask you a question about your home, your apartment or your condo or your house where you live. Your home is, click on your poll questionnaire and decide, is your home super efficient? Have you done all the insulation and air sealing that can possibly be done? You have low E windows. You have brand new high efficiency, uh, well-performing equipment in your heating and cooling equipment. Or are you somewhat efficient? Eh, when something fails, you'll replace it with a high efficiency model. You've had some of the insulation and air sealing done. Or is your house really not that efficient? Um, it just hasn't been a focus for you. You're not, you haven't been that interested in it. So I'm going to have you answer those questions. And then we're going to see if you're like most people in our climate in a couple of slides. OK, why do we care about home retrofits? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. First of all, there's a ton of energy savings opportunity in retrofits in general. This pie chart is a simplified version of some of the findings from our potential study. Um, that 83% represents both home and commercial building retrofit opportunities. Um, but it shows you what retrofit opportunity looks like next to new construction or equipment replacement. How come there's still so much potential there? Haven't we been running energy efficiency programs? Haven't we had high efficiency equipment and those sorts of things? I'll let you ponder those barriers as you answer your own questions about where you live. Um, and think about what has delayed you from making a retrofit decision if you're not one of the super efficient folks. Or if the savings potential is so great, why don't our programs just give us really big incentives to go out and do everything to our house and pay for it? So here's what McKinsey has to say about it. Um, we've uh, put a link to a really good study called Unlocking Energy Efficiency in the U.S. Economy from McKinsey on the website. Um, so see that nice big yellow bubble? That's home retrofits. Uh, the bubble represents the size of the energy savings opportunity, right? The existing private buildings as a commercial sector. So you can see the opportunity there. Um, and then if you look at the x-axis, that's how much it costs as a program to go after that opportunity. Why is this? Well, let's look at your data and ask ourselves why. Okay, 
So we have 12 or so percent of you said you were super efficient, right? And 70% of you said you'd done some stuff. You were moderately efficient. And hey, 17, 18% of you said you're not that efficient, right? You look a lot like the rest of us. Um, we'll look at those. You can click on uh, your pie chart to look at those results. My colleague here at the Energy Center, Scott Pig, took an in-depth look at the residential market in Wisconsin in a characterization study, and there's a link included to that. If you're designing or running a home retrofit program, please take a look at the study. It could be very helpful to you, especially if you're from a city or a municipality and you're just getting started with this. Um, so here's what his results show. Here in our climate, uh, insulation and air sealing are the big opportunity. 70% of the opportunity is in insulation and air sealing, in older homes especially, especially those built before we had pretty good building codes. 25% of our homes, at least here in Wisconsin, are excessively leaky. And whether or not you've gotten your insulation taken care of has really not a whole lot of relation to whether or not you're conservation-minded. So conservation-minded people miss opportunities just like everybody else does. So if you're not one of those super efficients, you can console yourself, you're normal. We also found some uh, things we'll share with you. So if you ask a homeowner, what's the best energy efficiency opportunity for you? Most of them will say, oh, I could get a window replacement. Um, that's what Scott's study found 10 years ago. We think, uh, we, we know that it's still that way out in the field. We think it's kind of like American Idol. Here is the window replacement. It's so cool. Everybody's voting for it. The American public are enthralled with window replacements. That pink guy over on the right, that's, that's Mr. Insulation. That's the hardest working measure in energy efficiency, and he gets no respect. Um, he, he's been ignored up until now pretty much by the American public, but he's getting some, says he's sexy. Indeed, here he is. He's quite sexy. Maybe we are seeing things change. Maybe we're seeing a greater focus on insulation and air sealing. Okay, that's really funny, but all of that humor aside, you know, these results are the same. Our results from our characterization 10 years ago are the same as this unscientific poll we took with you. It's part of the reason why the home retrofit market is really tough. It's a tough nut to crack as we try to build demand. So that's where our programs come in. So, and we see how high the stakes are. Um, here's uh, some, some data from a research project we conducted in 2005. My colleague Ingo Bench studied all the behavior changes and changed work practices from um, residential contractors after they had some education at the Better Buildings, Better Business Conference. And we looked at what's the financial savings of all those practices that they put in place. Well, it's 420000 to $2 million, depending on what they were doing, in the, and this is over the life of the home. That is a lot of economic value that energy efficiency can generate for the people who own their homes. That's an important high stake. And then here's the other high stake that we talked about. These jobs are local. They can't be outsourced. 92% of home retrofit products are made in the USA, and 100% of the workforce is local. You don't have to live in a big town or a big city to do it. This can happen out in, in small population areas as well. So the stakes here are really, really high in home retrofit. That's why we need great programs. Um, here's a simplified model of the kinds of interventions we can take with our programs. And if this is an area of interest for you, if you're just getting started in programs, we have that webinar coming up in July that will go into these topics in a lot more depth. And you see the kind of in interventions we can take. Let's just walk through them real quick. Financing, helping people get access to capital to do home retrofits. Um, we also have incentives. That's just giving people money to do things, trying to buy down some of the cost of a retrofit. Those are pretty common program features. And as we walk through what's happening on the ground in home retrofit, you're going to see a lot of emphasis, especially on financing. Um, you know, this market has different tipping points than maybe a big industrial customer or maybe just working at the government level to mandate higher appliance standards. So even if you're a homeowner and you have access to incentives and financing, you're still going to find consumers who need a little bit more of a boost. So maybe they need to be educated about the opportunity in their home. Maybe they need to be shown the difference between what insulation will do for them and what a window replacement will do for them. Maybe they need an energy audit so an auditor can look at the specific opportunities and prioritize them for them in their home. 
Um, we also need, maybe, maybe they even know that's what they should be doing and they haven't done it yet. I suspect a lot of us in the middle section and in the not so efficient section in our poll probably know we're supposed to be doing stuff, but we have other priorities. Um, so maybe we can install a customer feedback device that helps customers understand their energy use compared to their neighbors or helps a customer understand how prices are going to change. Even then, there are customers who are going to say, not now, I don't want a bunch of retrofit people walking through my house. I don't want to figure out how to find a qualified contractor. That's where a program can kick in some social marketing and some, um, some campaign and some excitement to get homeowners to finally cross that final barrier. So that's part, kind of an overview of program design. Take a look at that as we talk about what's happening on the ground. I want to talk about one more issue out in the retrofit market, and that's the size of firms. This is from our telephone poll. And we called HVAC contractors, insulation and air sealing contractors, and um, home performance consultants who are energy raters and can evaluate opportunities in homes. 61% of these firms are under five people. A big firm is 10 employees. This is not General Motors, folks. These are small companies. Um, even in ca places like California where we're seeing this start to take off to scale, a really big firm might be 75 employees. This creates some real challenges in dealing with how dispersed this employer base is. It's got, there's a lot of communication challenges there. If you're running a program, how are you going to find and engage these small businesses? Um, and they're practitioners, so they're not at home in an office so that you can find them in the middle of the day on email. They're out in the field. You might have to find out how to get a hold of them on their cell phone. They might not have a website. Um, so as program managers, we have to think about what training and marketing support we need so that these guys have the demand and they have the capability of going out and scaling up energy efficiency and job opportunities. But this means that these jobs are really local. These are small firms. They can be in large population centers or small. We don't have to ask all of our job seekers to migrate to a few large cities, so we really can see the opportunities spread around. So let's see, where are these opportunities? Big, blossoming opportunity in cities, many of whom are just getting started in, in the depths of their community sustainability and energy efficiency programs. This is an example of the Midwest Efficiency Cities projects of four cities that are collaborate, collaborating on best practices to share learning between each other. Um, so we have, in, in these four cities, we have some cities experimenting with customer feedback devices. River Falls has a citywide sustainability campaign. They've hired a sustainability director. They've got a lot of financing in place. Same with Milwaukee. Very big financing effort going on there. They're part of the Emerald Cities project. We've seen some community-based social marketing pilots that have been successful in Milwaukee. In Grand Rapids, they were active in sustainability before Michigan launched energy efficiency programs, and they had some very wily and clever ways of leveraging federal HUD money to promote energy efficiency. Um, I think you can think of examples being done like this in cities across the country um, by large municipalities and small. Program elements that are getting a lot of attention by cities are financing, especially PACE financing that ties retrofit loans to a utility bill or a property tax bill. There's a lot of investment centered around the theory that if people have the money, they'll get the job done. I think we've proven that mm, it's a little more complicated than that. Some cities are experimenting with neighborhood blitz programs to really focus and centralize and build excitement. Um, some are experimenting with customer feedback. This activity at the city level was largely absent a few years ago at any kind of a scale. So it's going to be fascinating to watch what this means, have these cities with skin in the game and really pushing, and they can push different levers than statewide energy efficiency programs. So that's the next level up would be our states. We've already seen and talked about the increased targets here. We know there's some regulatory restrictions on how much program funding can be considered cost effective per unit of energy and some of the challenges we have with home retrofits because they're pretty expensive programs to run. We hope that with some of these new aggressive targets, there'll be justification to do more work at this level. This will be enduring past the time um, that stimulus exists. Here's stimulus. Uh, it's been a hot, hot topic. Um, 
Also, we know that the Department of Energy is working at the federal level to do a lot of other work outside of the stimulus program, including some advanced codes and standards work. We've seen a lot of coverage of what's happening with the weatherization ramp up. The recovery through retrofit grants just brought millions of dollars into the region last week. And we've got all these community-based pilots through block grants. The tricky wicket of these is that the money is just starting to get out there. So our practitioners who are online today are like, yeah, okay, where's my demand, right? Um, but we think 2010 will move a lot faster and that demand will be built faster because this money is finally starting to hit the streets. Pretty exciting. Okay, I'm going to talk briefly about Homestar because if Homestar passes, it will have a significant impact, we think, on driving demand. For those of you who are not familiar with the Homestar program, there is a link to the Homestar Coalition in our resources page with more information than you could ever want about Homestar. Everything you need to know is there. I'll just cover some of the highlights here. First, not yet a law, not yet passed out of the legislature. Moving through the federal legislature, pretty big coalition supporting it, um, bipartisan support. If it passes, it will provide unprecedented levels of instant rebates to homeowners, financial incentives be of between $1,000 and $8,000, depending on a bunch of factors and how energy efficient um, they're making their homes. That could be a big driver. Second, requires a certified workforce that homeowners engage a certified trained workforce to get those higher levels of incentives. Third, puts air sealing with insulation. All the energy nerds are really happy about that. Um, and you can see what um, they're claiming in terms of job creation, 168,000 jobs. They believe that this is a conservative estimate, over 3 million home retrofits. Here's a factor that's really important in our region. This is a performance-based program. The first 25% of the money, if it's passed, will come out according to a formula to each state, but the rest of the money will be dependent on how well we perform getting our retrofits ramped up. So if there is a, ever a good reason to cooperate to make sure that we get our retrofits ramped up, it's to get a bigger piece of this pie for our states. Here's an indicator that I think is more exciting than any government program. We are seeing private industry retooling to push the home retrofit market forward. That can be more impactful and more enduring than um, than government programs or utility-run programs. This, this observation makes me more optimistic than any other indicator I've seen. It reminds me of the early days of the commercial green building movement and the stakeholders that were engaged in founding the U.S. Green Building Council. When you see the, these kind of marketing plans and product development lines being um, orientated um, to, to creating market demand, I think that's really a powerful message that we're seeing in the marketplace. And finally, to share some of the rhetoric and the rallying cry around the home retrofit market, this is a reminder that in the construction industry, this is not a recession, it's a depression. And it's a local, domestic depression. Steve Cowell from Conservation Services Group was at the ACI conference last week and said, we should not tolerate a depression in a domestic industry. There's, it's a lot of, uh, you can see kind of how this work is being positioned at a national level. Hopefully, that will help you expand your own bandwidth, especially if you're on the energy side and go, wow, this is really, this is really finally happening. Everything we wish for, I hope, is coming. I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, what's happening on the supply side. We've talked a little bit about the demand side. We'll talk about the supply side before we wrap up. Um, first of all, we asked our home performance contractors, insulators, air sealers, energy raters, hey, how's it going out there in our focus group? They do not yet see the demand. They're still experiencing some layoffs. Um, and when they're ready to hire and add capacity, they have laid off folks that they can hire back at the, when the first wave of new demand comes in. They also are reporting that there's a pretty talent-rich opportunity out there right now because there is so much stranded, high-quality talent. That'll get us through, I think, the first part of our scale-up but I want to talk about credentials a little bit because this is really where the opportunity to shape this industry is coming forward. I want to recommend a great study by the Center on Wisconsin Strategy. We've put a link to it on the resources page that gives detailed information about the major credentials in energy efficiency, especially in buildings. If you especially are an educator 
or you're developing a training program through workforce development and you want to know what credentials our employer is going to be looking for, everything you need to know is in this study. It's great. Um, I'll just mention a few here. The Building Performance Institute, BPI, which is a credential that we're going to see a lot in the home retrofit market. Um, in areas where, the, um, where organized labor is relevant in the retrofit market, we're going to see this um, Labor's International Weatherization Training Pathways curriculum. In the HVAC market, NATE, and, um, and a broader look at sustainability and green building in general are the LEED Green Associate and the LEED Accredited Professional. Um, and th their penetration of LEED is bigger on the commercial side than it is on the residential side. But those might be something that someone who wants to go into entrepreneurial management might consider. Many of the programs that we've mentioned already on the demand side are going to require some of these credentials, especially practitioners with the BPI or the LIUNA um, credential. And here's what's at stake when we think about credentials. Here's how we tie the career pathways to compensation. More credentials and more skills lead to higher wages, right? Um, this, uh, the, we, we can see here how degrees from a community college can bump our retrofit workers up another bar on the wage level. These wage levels are pretty consistent with what we asked um, in our focus group of our small employers. Um, this, this two bands in the middle are pretty much spot on for what um, our small employers are paying right now. For, and they have, these are the highest quality employers, are the people that are doing the best energy efficiency work out there. Um, very important to think about the role of education because these homes are all variable and we need to, there, it's not easy, it's not like doing new construction, there's so much variability between different situations and different homes. What this picture doesn't really show that we think is also promising is that um, because of the size of these businesses, there's a nice path to small business ownership for, for entrepreneurs or contractors who want to own their own businesses and that's also true in minority areas and in different demographics where the demographics match the customer. So that's, a, that's a pretty exciting. Employers in our focus group express a lot of enthusiasm about training and credentials and a lot of support for apprenticeship programs and so we think that's going to yield a nice promising future. I, I promised you we'd tell you huh, what happened to the 50 million dollars in Department of Labor money and the answer is lots of stuff. Um, we really wanted to see how much of that is going to create trained people in the home retrofit market. That 50 million went for all kinds of renewable energy training, it went for smart grid training, it went for commercial building training and we tried to piece out in two piles of money the energy training partnership grants and the state energy sector partnership grants. We tried to pull out, okay how many workers are we going to get in home retrofit out of that? Well we know in Wisconsin that there'll be a, over 900 people going through a specialized apprenticeship program just because it doesn't say BPI on this slide doesn't mean that they won't be able to pass the BPI exam when they come out of that apprenticeship program. In Illinois, we were able to track out a commitment to at least 485 certifications from BPI and at least we estimate 30 or so lead accredited professionals in the residential sector. There's a much bigger push in the commercial sector. Um, some of these grants were difficult to track because they also affected multiple states. And then in Michigan, there were some programs that looked at green building in the residential sector kinds of credentials, but they weren't exactly tied to BPI or LEED. Um, now, these are educated wild guesses. Um, these programs are just emerging. Some changes, I'm sure, will be made. Um, so one thing to think about, the Illinois grant identified that by 2015 they think they're going to need a thousand energy auditors in Illinois and 3,476 insulation and envelope contractors. Now you can see that those numbers there do not add up to those numbers so that's kind of an interesting conundrum but as we think about the stranded capabilities right now that might be the right number because um, we're going to have people that we're bringing back to work first. Also these grants because they're from workforce development's perspective also include placement services. So these aren't just going to train people, they're going to put them into jobs. They also include other support services, um, things to help um, support people if they may have challenges to getting back to work. So employers should really check out with their local job center what services are available to you and what kind of people are you going to be producing that we can work with. Um, there's an unprecedented number coming of more highly qualified, knowledgeable, entry-level candidates. 
Um, we also want to emphasize, once we make these new people, we need to continue to educate them, especially in the home retrofit market, because things are so different with every home. So we've, um, we know there are programs by ratepayer funded programs. I will, of course, plug the Better Buildings, Better Business Conference that the Energy Center produces, as well as our um, continuing ed on Energy Center University. And we're also seeing now community and technical colleges starting to embrace these credentials. Um, and, and starting to launch programs. Very exciting to see that happening. So what do we think? What are our um, supply and demand conclusions? First of all, I think we've concluded that an industry is being born. Um, if you've been in energy efficiency, it's kind of hard to believe that, but an industry really is being born in a new level of professionalism and scale. And there is a focus, even if it's not always perfect, on quality and energy savings. So maybe those savings aren't always verified, but there's an effort in all of these programs to prioritize the highest savings opportunities and the highest level of skills. There's a big focus on financing and incentives. The good news is the barriers around financing are going to go away. The bad news is that's not all the barriers there are. We have all these behavioral barriers. But it's mostly good news. At least we won't have lack of financing as an excuse anymore. Um, Another piece of good news, we're going to see unprecedented levels of knowledgeable entry-level people. Um, I don't think we're even ready to wrap our heads around that. They still need field experience. They still need to learn what really goes on in the field. But they'll have a better baseline of knowledge. And that will give us a better opportunity for continuing education so we can deepen our best practices. Finally, the small employer voice we've concluded is still missing. We need to bring those small contractors to the table and find out how it really works in the real world. Some of our recommendations, especially to my brethren in energy efficiency, we need to believe and prepare. It's really coming. Um, and we need to integrate and coordinate between states, between programs, but also between disciplines of workforce development and energy efficiency. So supply and demand really are connected. We're working together. Focus on credentialing and certifying our workforce. Educate those customers. It, there is life after window replacement. There's other things that you can do. Um, you can vote for other candidates on American Idol. And also, what's the value proposition? Why should you consider a qualified, trained contractor instead of just getting your nephew Earl to do the job for you for cheaper? Um, let's engage those community-based social marketing levers so we can drive demand. Let's get our small contractors involved in workforce development, get them helping to shape the future, and build those continuing education strategies. And the result is a really bright future. This is a domestic industry. We can mobilize a domestic, very localized workforce around meaningful jobs that will help the environment, make our homes more safe, more comfortable, more durable, and, and make us more energy independent.